Hey guys, welcome to another OJ Health Radio. I'm here with Rosie Peacock. Rosie, thank you for joining me Thanks on the for show. Me. Rosie is uh, going to be going in depth with some really cool things that we've touched on in the podcast in the past, but not gone into depth and how it can actually be really beneficial for you and your business and depending on where you want to go. And that's going to be psychedelics. So, Rosie, first off, uh, tell us a little bit about what you do in your business, Conscious Enterprise, and how you got where you are now. Cool, thank you. So I have quite a weird journey. Um, so I'm the CEO of Conscious Enterprise Limited. I'm also a business and mindset coach for people who are wanting to grow and scale soul aligned businesses online. But my research and my background is in positive psychology and coaching psychology. And before that was in teaching. So I started my career in um, teaching secondary English. Um, and after a really big phase of burnout, I fell massively in love with uh, well-being. So I retrained as a yoga um, and meditation teacher. I dropped out of teaching English at school, obviously, because, well, it was a lot better. Yep. And then I came to um, do my master's in positive psychology and coaching psychology because I started to become fascinated by this idea of being able to flourish and hit human potential, which is something that I'd gone into teaching for in the first place. I wanted to see kids flourish and hit their potential. Um, and then there was this whole science behind it that I discovered. Um, and part of my research started to look into other ways that people were essentially hacking their systems in order to reach their positive potential. So. For me, I was looking into things like um, how caffeine would affect people's athletic performance. And it started with quite a sports science element to it. Um, and then before long, I came across this really interesting research on psychedelics. So um, for those of you who've never really heard of psychedelics or you don't know much about them, the word psychedelic comes from a combination of two words. So you've got the Greek word psyche, which means your mind. And then you've got delos, which means to manifest or reveal. So the literal word of itself means to reveal your mind to itself. And although it's a substance which is actually um, illegal in a lot of places around the world, quite controversially, um, in the recent years, especially the last kind of 10, 15 years, the research has been opened up on it and it's been moved from a scale where you cannot do research to a one where you can. And we now actually have research centres all around the UK and in the US where people are starting to make scientific, evidence-based, journal-published research around psychedelics, the neuroscience of it, the brain scanning imagery, how it interacts in clinical settings with things such as addiction, depression, anxiety, and then also any of the positive effects, so the positive psychology, ways that it in increases openness um, and human flourishing and op optimism and gratitude and other things like that. Um, so my dissertation was all around coaching and psychedelics. I felt like psychedelics is a very natural kind of plant medicine way to to potentially optimize human functioning and coaching is a way that we've developed to optimize human functioning so to me it made sense that com like compiling the two together would make incredible things happen coming out of that time um, I really started to explore business and marketing and fell massively in love with um, online sales funnels I'm a bit of a freak like that <laughs> Um, but you, you know, a little funnel you want to put on Instagram. <laughs> yeah, Has that got a name? Felix the funnel. Felix the funnel. <laughs> My pet funnel. So um, as I started to fall more and more in love it with um, online marketing and how all of that stuff worked, um, I started to have like almost two separate sides of things. So I was doing a lot of my coaching. Um, and then I had my kind of separate side bit, which was my psychedelic research and my integration coaching. Um, and then I had a particularly interesting trip that I went on myself. Um, and I went on a, on a journey itself to Wales, but then also on a psychedelic trip. And during that time, I had an experience with the mushrooms where I realized that combining together business in a conscious soul aligned way which was something I was very passionate about bringing kind of yoga philosophy into kind of online marketing and sales funnels and like making business a really good soul nourishing thing to do could be combined with psychedelics to increase creativity optimism openness to nature connection between like the person leading the business and their team so this idea came up uh, where I started to investigate how to run legal business mastermind retreats um, and so I'd been on plant medicine retreats before um, and there are a few different places around the world where 
certain substances are legal and available. And so during that time, I spent a lot of time researching the legality, the ethics, the kind of business side of things as well. And now I have pulled together four of the kind of leading people who are researchers in the field to lead a retreat all around business, psychedelics, conscious enterprise and uh, plant medicine. So. Yeah, that's it's quite an extensive story. like journey. Like, <laughs> and I've asked that before. It's been like ten seconds. I'm like, oh, yeah, I've got another question now. But like you said about the trip when you're in Wales, describe what happened. It might be harder to describe out of the moment than in the moment. Yeah. What was the feeling, and what did it look like in your mind when you knew this was the journey you wanted to take? So, on that trip. yeah, this is a great question. And I'm starting to get a bit shy because you guys are all going to think I'm a little bit crazy now. <laughs> oh, no, we've had some <laughs> right weirdos on the show. <laughs> so in terms of um, the actual experience, I felt like I was communicating with the mushroom directly. And I felt like the mushrooms were essentially initially there was this whole process where I almost felt like I was dying. And that sounds really horrible if it sounds like, oh my God, why would you want that experience? But it wasn't like a, a scary death. It was like a letting go of all of the parts of me that weren't really serving me. And I could feel it was like almost like a ceremonial dying of my ego, the things that I was like very attached to in the world. And I was attached to these ideas that some people are more important than others and some people have status and other people don't mm -hmm. and like that some people are better than others. And then as soon as like that part of me melted away, I started to realize that actually when you start to let all of that bit go, you can work with anyone. And I started to think, well, what do I really want? I want the biggest amount of impact positively that I possibly can. And the mushroom said, you are, are essentially our, our spokesperson, our guide, our representative, and humankind in order to heal its relationship with the earth, with its relationship with itself, with, with the creativity that it has within it, which is its God potential. In order to heal all of that, people need to experience a plant medicine a ceremony and the people who need it most are the ones with the most power and the ones with the most power are the ones leading businesses and so I thought to myself you know I don't know if I'm exactly the right person to do this and then it just came up it was like well you've been chosen so you don't have a choice and I was like oh guess I just have to think about how now then because yeah. it wasn't it wasn't even a question of like can I do this I just you know, I just knew that, and it, it felt like it was a really big project because at the time I hadn't, like I was working my way to hitting my first six figures, but I certainly wasn't what I would think of as a particularly established business coach. And it felt like a really, really, really big project with loads of ethical landmines, loads of legal landmines, like the potential to just get yourself in a real load of trouble. Well, it's exciting at the same time. And like you described it as dying, but was it not more of a feeling of being reborn? Yeah, and, and the two are actually completely the same thing that I've realized from having these psychedelic experiences is that we have in our life so much fear around death and dying, so much sadness about it, but in all of the Eastern philosophies, a death is just a rebirth. It's going on to the next opportunity, whether that's merging with the greater consciousness or going into a different lifetime. And it's just as like your breath goes out and then it goes into the leaf which that symbiotic relationship so is death and rebirth and so it's actually not as scary perhaps as as we think and that's actually come up in some of the research so um there was some research around using mushrooms in palliative care so people nearing end of life and it's really, really interesting. I mean, who would have thought to have given mushrooms as palliative care? The person yeah. who thought up that study and got it passed. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> I mean, claps to them. But at the same time, what came back from it was even more remarkable, which is the fact that when you give mushrooms to people nearing end of life, they make peace completely with the fact that they may die. Some of them actually extended their life considerably from the kind of diagnosis or prognosis they've been given. And some of them were just so completely okay. And these were all people who were suffering with depression about end of life and not being able to come to terms with it. And for six months after, so they had one psychedelic experience. And for six months after that, there was 
a sign of it being the no depression, basically. Wow. Which is so <laughs> absolutely would mad. Be something which they'd have to kind of like top up. And this is the funny thing yeah, when you don't know the studies. Yeah, and so we we have with some of the studies, like the evidence that as long as you are integrating the experience correctly. So um, I'll talk about integration in a second about what that actually entails, but. If you integrate the experience properly, then it's a one-off that you need. So with most antidepressants we currently have clinically at the moment, you have to take one every single day, sometimes several times a day, in order to get any sort of effect from them. And they don't work for everyone. And it's known that antidepressants can actually make some people worse. And um, with the trials and studies that have come through largely around psychedelics, and most of them have been done either around um, LSD, ketamine and mushrooms at the moment they're just embarking on their first study around DMT as well so that's um, the main component in ayahuasca but the types of things that have come up from these studies is that it doesn't just affect you in the in the time period that you've taken it in fact during the time period that you've taken it it doesn't have a great deal of antidepressant effect it's not whilst it's in your system it's afterwards so it changes the way that your brain is rewired and restructured in order to make it so that it's easy for you to change your thought processes change your thought paths and usually it would take something like a long, long-term um, commitment to yoga and meditation, things like that, which increase your neuroplasticity. But with this, your neuroplasticity is rewired essentially very instantaneously. So it's really interesting. Powerful, but definitely intriguing for a lot of people, no doubt hearing this, but have the studies shown any negative effects that have just jumped out? Because I, I think like, when it comes to studies, we can always find what we want. Mm. And that's been massively apparent in the recent goings on around the world. And like, it sounds massively positive. Has there been any negatives that we think? Or when we look at the negative reports, is it people are trying to study to find those negatives to stop them becoming legal in certain places? Well, interestingly... On your opinion there as well. Yeah, I mean, I've got always going to bring my own bias yeah, in as exactly, well. Yeah. So I, I can't really say it in a completely unbiased way. But from the studies that have come out so far, there have been no, there's been no evidence oh, so sweet. far of it having any sort of harmful effect. Now, these have been delivered in very safe situations. So I'm not saying there's no harmful effects from psychedelics. Absolutely not. I mean, I've personally had harmful, like, yeah. well, of what I would perceive in the time to have been a bad trip even though the after effects still felt positive i suppose dosage makes a lot of difference as well right the dose. so you've got three things that you always need to consider to have a safe session which is set setting and dosage so your set is the mindset that you have it's the way that you're thinking and so you don't ever go into psychedelics to run away from your problems you will be confronted with them mm -hmm. the way that it works is essentially it lights up all the areas of your brain at once so it's kind of like dreaming and being awake all at the same time and when you dream you process things from the subconscious and when you're awake you're processing the conscious so it allows the conscious mind to meet the subconscious mind and to communicate with it in a way that we just don't have access to which is why people say it can be like doing 10 years of therapy in one go obviously that's not going to feel nice sometimes and if you're doing it in a party situation expecting to have a fun time and you're dealing with potentially 10 years of therapy yeah. you're going to be disappointed however if you're going into a therapeutic environment the people there are well trained and they have prepared you through three um, sessions of preparation therapy to kind of know what you'd be working with and dealing with they go into um, and this is how I do it on my retreat as well is uh, they go into um, a laid down position, they have an eye mask on and they really take it as a very internal experience. So it's not so much like tripping, walking around being all like, ah. it's a uh, much more of a kind of therapeutic session where they've gone very inwards on themselves and they're exploring the inner part of their psyche. And then following that with um, integration therapy or in my case, integration coaching. Um, and so with integration work, this is what I specialized on in my dissertation because nobody had really created stuff around it. There's no training around it. Like I'm the first person to look at it in the coaching space at the moment, which I, f I find blows my mind. Yeah, especially when like, I know loads of people that do it or they go, there's a couple of friends that go to Colombia or Peru and have like an ayahuasca retreat and they probably go every year or two. Right, but it is coming more mainstream. I don't know because I've been more exposed to it. Mm. Because it's just like that train of thought. Like, like you see, 
you think about a red car and you see a red car every five minutes that's sort completely of the like, when you're aware bias. of the psychedelics it's going to be shown to you by the universe but do you feel it is becoming more mainstream now i think yeah definitely it's opened up a lot so even since i've been studying it there's been like a surge of like popular media on it so things like when if paltrow's goop um and you've got like a couple of new documentaries that have come out on netflix one of them is called dosed as well which is about how and um, people suffering with really severe addictions so i think hers was um heroin addiction but also f through other ones like crack which are you know they actually are physically dependent addictions yeah there's a certain um trip called ibogaine which is a, a kind of tree root and it allows you to c come off a physically addictive substance such as alcohol or um or heroin or something like that with absolutely no negative effects because of the way that it restructures the brain so you don't have the deficiency anymore yeah um so that's just come out on Netflix. There's a ton of books. I don't know if you've ever heard of Michael Pollan's. Um, he's just written a book. He's quite a famous guy. Um, he wasn't a psychedelic researcher, but he got really interested into the topic. Um, and his book was called How to Change Your Mind. Um, and it's all about the science of psychedelics. Um, so yeah, there's plenty more people in the more mainstream who are talking about it. And I think it used to be just mega taboo. We're always going to get interruptions outside, but hey, it's in nature. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been worse in a park like we were describing it before, but it definitely beats Zoom. It's true. Uh, with it. Yeah, so where are we going before I rudely is it interrupted more, you? Is it more mainstream? Yeah. This uh, happens a couple of times on podcasts where I lose my train. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so how, how do you get into it anyway? Um, where does someone start? Because you've mentioned anxiety, depression, and I think mental health has been massively at the forefront uh, obviously we're, we're just getting out of lockdown yeah and i know or knew a couple of people that unfortunately committed suicide and um there's been a lot more people like during this time and so mental health has got a lot more media attention recently mm. um i feel it could do a lot more but where would someone go if they're feeling like they need to do something about it and the modern medicine shall yeah. we say isn't really uh, touching the sides mm -hmm. what do they do what where do they start and uh, i think it's good to mention this isn't a prescription absolutely like not a just prescription. for insurance like <laughs> this is like where would someone potentially start do some extra research and, and look sure. at it yourself so um i would always advise going to meet with somebody before even booking a retreat um, so you can, it depends what you're approaching it for. You can see integration therapists or you can see integration coaches. If you are suffering with something clinically wrong, a mental health condition, really, really important to find a, a psychedelic therapist because that means that they have all of the qualifications relating to therapy. So it's all about knowing how to deal with trauma that might surface. They will be able to explain and advise the best ways to go about it. Obviously here in the UK, it's not legal. Mm -hmm. So when you're planning it, the safest places will always be the legal ones because they can be the most kind of safely policed. So our closest place here in the UK is over in the Netherlands. Um, you can have access to psilocybin based truffles, which are a form of magic mushroom. Um, and it's a lot less strong than something like ayahuasca. Um, personally, I would say if you are suffering with some form of like severe mental health condition, and you know, maybe depression and anxiety isn't quite severe, but like, you know, if you're suffering with something any more severe than that, I will probably go and see somebody to advise you anyway, whether or not, you know, is relevant to, for, for you to even take it. Cause for some things it actually flares it up. Mm -hmm. So um, for example, schizophrenia, it's not something that I would ad advocate or advise taking psychedelics with ever. Um, but when it comes to depression and anxiety, it's much more about how it just allows you to break the neural pathways that you're in. And often anxiety is a thought loop and depression is a thought loop is a habitual thought that you've thought again and again and again over time. And so going and booking a space in a retreat, for example, the Psychedelic Society, they run um, plant medicine retreats. They're a UK based organization, but they 
organized tiered retreats. So based on your wages and your salary, um, three and four day immersion retreats, which also um, focus on having the integration therapy as a big part of it. There's also quite a lot of databases online where you can find places that have like reviews on them and you can really find out about them. I would search for the words plant medicine if you're looking for it to treat things like anxiety, depression, or even just kind of disillusionment with life, which is equally as much of a, and I mean, personally, I don't really like to use the word mental illness because I think it can get people stuck into an idea that- It has a label on it as well. Right. Which and, I think a lot of diseases and stuff do. Yeah, and I don't know how helpful that is for somebody to perceive themselves to be sick because being sick is something that we almost, in the West especially, believe to be um, something that has happened to us and not something that we are contributing to. And so I think by calling it, saying something like, I have depression, like it is something that feels really difficult to change, but I think it can be much more empowering to, to not kind of use the label. Um, and so, you know, looking for things like plant medicine, um, and, and retreats around that are a really, really good place to start. Um, I would always say your first session should be with somebody who knows what they're doing. An you definitely don't experiment. Yeah, an experienced trip sitter is essential. And of course, I know that in this country it's not legal, but if you are for whatever reason, like not able to go and travel, like I would just always say in any situation that you're going to do it in the safest way you can do it is with somebody else who isn't tripping so they are compass mentors they know what's going on they understand the, the substances you've taken the amount that you've taken so that you will always be safe and secure now there was a study done by david nutt um, who was the government um, kind of advisory person around drugs mm -hmm. um, and this was i think in 2011 or 12 i can't remember the exact date and he put a table of the substances that were most harmful to least harmful in terms of the classified illegal substances. Right at the top, guess what the number one was? Ayahuasca. Alcohol. Oh. Alcohol. Oh. Yeah, crazy, huh? <laughs> I thought you were just talking about uh, psychedelics then. No, so these are all the different substances. So number one was alcohol. A few down from that was heroin. A few down from that was cigarettes. A few down from that was crack cocaine. Um, and all the way down at the very, 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 very bottom of the list, the least harmful compound. Um, and so they measured it in two parts of harm. Harm to the person, like physically, harm to like the person mentally, and then harm to anybody around them through them taking that substance. Um, and magic mushrooms was like the absolute lowest, lowest, lowest. Was um, caffeine on that list? Do you know? Ooh, interesting question. I, I'll be honest with you, I can't remember. Because I think like the perception makes people think things are worse than they are. Mm. So if alcohol being at the top, yeah, and smoking and things like that, that there's so much we can do with our health and things that we think are going to be bad because it's perceived and laws and things. And even when it comes to uh, actually taking responsibility for our health and people are saying oh, I'm going to do this this and that but I'm not going to cut alcohol out mm. and that's what the top of that whole list right and the same is like looking at health now and there's, there's I wish there was a lot more in the media about helping your immune system like something I'm completely geeky about like helping people's immune immune function that there's not this well you've got to do this you've got to wear a mask you've got a distance and all this stuff but what about cutting alcohol, lowering mm. the amount you're smoking. I think smoking has actually gone down, someone said, um, which is understandable, but just having that awareness over what these things do. And caffeine being one of the biggest things which impacts people's health, and I drink caffeine, it's just awareness mm. of how much we have it. Yeah, caffeine's not on there. I've just brought it up now. Have a look at that list. So we've got alcohol at the top. Now, this is obviously a condensed version of the list, just the ones that they want to show, but we've got alcohol at the top, followed by heroin, followed by crack followed by methamphetamine, followed by cocaine, tobacco, amphetamines, cannabis, GBH, uh, benzodiazepines, ca uh, ketamine, methadone, uh, methadrone, butane, anabolic steroids, cat, I don't even know what that is, <laughs> um, ecstasy. And so by the time we're getting down to these ones, the harm to others is nearly non-existent and the harm yeah. to the users is very very small so i think it's interesting looking at that because like like coming from the bodybuilding world with mm. steroids being as low as that mm. okay it's still got a bit of a chunk with with harm to users 
And like alcohol, the biggest thing is harm to others. Mm. Like over 50% of what the impact is, is harm to others. Mm. And people don't realize what that does. Like with, right. with like switching the psychological impact as on relationships and then what you do when you're like, I suppose there's tripping with mushrooms and you're in a controlled environment technically someone with alcohol is tripping in a different way mm -hmm. when people wake up and don't know what they've done. Right, exactly. People don't see that as well, as bad as mushrooms. And the, and the fighting that can come from it or the, you know, the ways that people can, you know, drink, drink driving, for example, the impacts that that has for yeah. people. I mean, obviously, if you're going to take psychedelics, don't drive, for goodness yeah, sake. Yeah, well, if you're in a controlled <laughs> environment, yeah. Hopefully there won't be many roads and stuff like close by, but that's... Yeah, you know, to, to see that and but it's public public perception mm. and like the same with like they want to switch things and this is going into a bit of politics a bit now but they want to make masks as like not wearing a mask to be the same level as drink driving and how can that ever be close to it when alcohol has that big impact on other people mm. and taking like how we said about taking responsibility and we've had a conversation on that earlier today and um, it's crazy we like chatted for what hour and a half like we said to do the podcast a while back and we probably could have had about three podcasts worth of information yeah. <laughs> not all the information we would have had to cut some out but um talking about taking responsibility and i think you mentioned about putting that word on and like saying you're depressed saying it mm. gives it a form yes like saying i've got this i've got um anxiety. you become attached to yeah. it and like some people don't like mm. you're so attached to it you don't want to get healthy because you get attention mm -hmm. from the actual illness as such yeah uh, my first ever therapist <laughs> i was so angry at the time like in my um this this was my early 20s and i'd dropped out of my first ever uni that i did um quite early on because i felt really really depressed because it wasn't aligned um and what i hadn't realized at the time was for me i perceived depression to be us not being completely aligned with our true purpose <laughs> yeah and, and not being able to have our human flourishing if you look at any plant it naturally flourishes it doesn't have to think about it it just goes into its absolute optimum potential humans when we don't we become very depressed because it's not how nature intended us to be nature intended us to be at our optimum and so when we sabotage that and we do things that take us away from that and we give ourselves disappointments and things like that, it can make us really depressed. So if you're in a loveless marriage or if you have um, you know, a job that you don't really like or you're doing a course that you know isn't right for you, these things, when you don't do something about them over time, breeds this feeling of being very depressed. But it's not depression and illness, it's a, it's a symptom of your life as you need it to be and the life as it is not being fully aligned with each other. And I think if we can see it like that, we're like, oh, well, yeah, I can just make changes and things will start to be better. But it can feel very difficult to make changes when you're right in the pit of depression and when it's really low. And my first ever therapist said to me, well, how does it serve you? And I was like, who do you think you are telling me yeah, depression serves me, right? Because I wasn't ready to introspect, but it absolutely did because I could say I'm not going to class today because I'm depressed. And I could get a sick note from somebody and they would let me off because I'm depressed. And it meant that I could continue to let myself off the hook and to not have to make changes because I was depressed. And I think it took me a lot longer to heal from that because I had no real concept, you know, when I, when I went to the doctors uh, later on, you know, a few years later, they'd changed their whole perspective, which wasn't just, you know, take these pills because you're depressed and you have some deficiency in your brain. It was now try changing and seeing if going out in daylight helps and going out and doing exercise because those are the things that are for optimum well-being. And the reason that those things are important to cure depression is because it's getting you closer to that optimum functioning, which is essentially like as spiritual beings that's all we want mm -hmm. we just want to be the fullest potential of ourselves but i find some people struggle to admit that mm. or realize it nice no, admit it to themselves rather than other people yeah or the people that are around them like it's so true about you know, the average of the five people and i was so played out people saying that the average of the five people around you but they're drawing the energy on from you then you're going to be low on energy as well mm. and like you said about like the therapist and you were essentially triggered I put a post out the other day and it is that if you're triggered by this, you probably need to hear it more than others. <laughs> it's like, if you're anxious, it's your fault. If you're overweight, mm. it's your fault. 
If you're unhappy, it's your fault. If you're not, like, you haven't got the money you want, it's your fault. And it was about me not taking responsibility where I've been mm. when I had an eating disorder. It was my fault. Mm -hmm. And but if you'd have told me then, oh, like, yeah. I'm competing in bodybuilding. I'm so happy. Like yeah, because I'm eating bloody boiled chicken and broccoli every day, and got no life. I went on a first date to the cinema and took chicken and broccoli and didn't get a second date. Um, <laughs> That stung out of the cinema. <laughs> yeah, that, that ain't gonna happen anymore. Like, that was that was before social distancing was a thing, and that <laughs> happened. <laughs> um, <laughs> lost the train of thought again. But oh, that's brilliant. It just totally triggered me. Yeah. And like taking that responsibility, we've completely gone off the train of thought of psychedelics, but. I but do you know massively... that's funny though because it really links to my most recent experience with them and that was all about taking responsibility and so I'm it's kind of almost like a word of warning as well as much as anything but like my most recent experience with psychedelics was actually um was what I would consider a really bad trip um in in terms of like it was really uncomfortable and you know when you've had like a really bad dream and you kind of feel a bit like shaken afterwards a bit jangled get back to sleep as well um, and so I, what I had with that experience was this feeling um, and this kind of theme kept coming up around um, not really being safe because it was basically a victim mentality playing out in a lot of different ways and a lot of different examples. Um, and not all of them was I me. It was like, you know, when you're in a dream and you see someone who's supposed to be that person, but they're not actually that person. It was kind of like that, but with myself. And so I was living out all of these different lifetimes. And in some of them, I was on crack. And in some of them, I was like a prostitute of a street. And, in some of them, and all of these ones. And I was like, oh, poor me. My life is so awful in these situations. And what I realized was afterwards, I came out really shook, but I realized the whole trip was just saying, where are you not taking responsibility? Because in all honesty, it's the solution to your problems. Any problem you have, anything you want to fix, as soon as you own it, you have the ability to change it. But as and you long become free as well. Right? And people don't want to own it because then they have to change it. But in changing it, you then get the solution to the problem. So I yeah, although like the experience of it wasn't particularly nice, like nobody really wants to live through, you know, a li a lifetime of several different tragedies happening coming out of it and having that shift in perspective it felt like i'd had a reset button hit on my brain did you manage to that sounds really wrong me saying did you manage to link it back to different parts obviously not being on crack and not being a prostitute like, <laughs> I've not i don't know we've, we've not life. spoken about that yet but <laughs> like, yeah surprise did you manage to link it back and see where it was resonating with you in parts of your life Yes, definitely, but much more um, abstract. So it wasn't, a, and this was what shook me from it, is that a lot of my psychedelic experiences had been deeply spiritual and had linked to God consciousness and the collective knowing of all things and, you know, how people were um, not connecting to nature properly and all of this kind of stuff had come up and it had been very profound. And this one, I was like, I felt like it had happened to me, which was mm -hmm. the whole entire point of it. Um, so there was parts of it that I was quite confused about because I wanted to make sense of it. I wanted to be like, oh, that was that part of my life or that part of my memory. But I think what my brain did was it went, right, we're gonna explore this because it, it brings up for you whatever it is you need to work through. It's like a cleansing process. And particularly with plants like ayahuasca, it really does deeply cleanse whatever issues you're working with at the time. And it's bizarre how it knows how to bring them up for you. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it was this idea that I was overworking through lockdown, almost to what I'd admit now is to be a point of workaholism, because I had F all else to do, you know? Nothing else to do with my yeah. time, a pretty successful business that I enjoyed, things that I liked out of it, and it. And I'm, as an extrovert, I was communicating with people through my work, it's so. It's a lot worse for you as an extrovert than an introvert. Completely, and like, I'm a little bit too extrovert, <laughs> so that was like really hard. Um, and so I fell into this position where I was waking up, I was looking at my phone straight away, and before lockdown, I would not pick my phone up until 11 o'clock when I'd start working, but at this point I was waking up and I'd just see what was going on on my phone and then I'd fall into just like looking at emails and then I wouldn't actually stop working until I'd put myself to bed at like 11 o'clock properly. It would kind of be this on off working in the background. And what I came to realise from that trip and that experience was actually 
the victim mentality I was having was to myself around work. Oh, I've got to work all the time. Oh, I'm so burnt out. So even out. now you've fallen into the, like, like recently fallen into the victim mentality. Yeah, and so, but you don't kind of realise at the time. And so I wasn't doing anything enough to change it because I hadn't realised. And then having had that experience, I was like, ah, oh, okay. So this is an invitation to stop even victimising myself. You have the most flies around in your garden. Ever. Look over there, how crazy is that? Jeez. I know, I've not seen so many flies. Maybe it's just me. I need to like, have a shower <laughs> or something. <laughs> My aunt has a pond next door, so uh, I think it's that. Flies and stuff on there. It's, it's funny you say that because like, we do get dragged back into like victim mentality. and like, I had it at the start of lockdown. Like, I remember that it was like the 20th of March and they said gyms are shut. I'm like, what the fuck am I going to do? And then like the Sunday morning, I was just basically as low as I could be. Mm. But they're going to be shut for like three weeks and not training. And here we are four months later. And then I was pushing home workouts and thinking, I don't like home workouts. I like my cycling, but not beating myself up about it. But I was just, everything's like, it's a victim. Mm. And like, as we've said about energy of people around me, all that sort of stuff. And it wasn't my fault. And then actually my perception of it wasn't my fault. Mm. Going super down a rabbit hole yeah. of like, this is the study, then this person's involved, that person's involved, the prime minister should do this. And I'm like putting out stuff which just wasn't me or mm. wasn't like I thought was me mm. and having to take responsibility of it and realizing that we can still control a hell of a lot that's going on. Yeah. And yes, it pissed me off that the gyms weren't open and that actually when I say to clients how much working out has an impact on your productivity mm. but we can make a positive out of the situation Completely. as i said like two new business ideas and finding my love for producing music so did you manage to find a positive out of that workaholism completely um i had my best launch in my business i had a six-figure month which was absolutely insane um i launched several programs during the lockdown as well all of them sold out which was brilliant so there was a this huge drive and i think when you put all of your focus into one particular area you start to see results very quickly in that particular area we're actually quite miraculous as manifestors of things that we want um, and not in a woo way like i look at the psychology of manifesting and again this actually came to me through a psychedelic experience it was like um, I don't know if you've heard much about law of attraction or if your yeah. listeners have, but... Um, that and like think and grow rich and stuff like that. Exactly. So it's this idea, essentially, that what you think about is what plays out into your life. And this is not a new idea. So a lot of the stuff around um, law of attraction is seen to be quite a new age thing, but it goes back to ancient yoga philosophy, which is your thoughts become your actions, your actions become your habits, and your habits become your destiny. Um, it's a phrase from the Upanishads, one of the ancient, ancient Vedic texts. And so for thousands of years, we've known that how we think and act on a daily basis changes the outcomes that we have in our life. And yet it still seems to be something that people perceive to be so magical and mythical, but it's really not. In psychology, we have a term called cognitive bias. I'm sure you know about it, which is the more you think about something in a certain way, the more you get caught and reinforced into that way of thinking about it. This links really nicely actually with psychedelics because what psychedelics does that's so magical is it breaks you out from thinking in a default mode network and it allows you to melt myelination in your brain. So myelination, for those of you who don't know, is when your neuron synapses, between two of them, it insulates it so it can get from one place to another very, very quickly. Um, and the more you use a certain thought process, the more it wants to insulate it just to save energy in your brain. We always want to save energy. That's what the kind of creatures we are. And so when we uh, melt away the myelination, we essentially melt away our autopilot or the way that we want to think so that we can think outside of the box and it's why people become incredibly creative with psychedelics it's why people can break out of things um and and can break out of you know depressive thought loops or anxious patterns because it gets you to just kind of zoom out and see the bigger picture how do you link that with people's goals because uh, um when i've set goals in the past and i've said it before i think it's led to self-sabotage afterwards because it's what happens after the goal and that one of my goals now is that I'm climbing Mount Everest on my 47th birthday. It's the year my dad died, and yeah, I've got what, what well over 10 years um, now to actually do it and move forward with it. But again, when you say to people you want to climb Everest, like yeah, what the fuck? Um, <laughs> but 
I have a chapter on it in my book and the goal setting is that no one's goal is to climb Everest mm. it's to get up and come back down again and whole life is about is you can resonate with climbing Everest you get to a certain point you come back down you climatize and so on and go back up but how does that link when it comes to goal setting um, and looking at the psychological aspect of it do you work with clients on that yeah absolutely so when I was looking into the research around coaching and psychedelics the main thing that happens when you come out of a psychedelic experience is you have an existential shift or what they call a quantum leap in the way that you think which means that you were thinking this way and then something huge happens and you really need to integrate that new way of thinking and perceiving and it might not necessarily be obvious how that relates to your goals but it will clear stuff that is blocking you from getting to them because what you are putting out is what you want into the world so for example say you've got this idea that you want to climb Everest and you know that you've got some mental blocks around it you've got this story for example that you self-sabotage it's a story it's not true like you've got some evidence for it because it's happened in the past but there is no evidence that that needs to continue to happen in the future and ah do you know I've got the perfect quote that I'm going to read out after I've told you about this but Essentially, when it comes to setting the goals, it can clear the stuff that's blocking you from getting to them. So setting an intention before going into a psychedelic experience, like one of those goals, the stuff that will surface up are the old stories and the old patterns that will need to be cleared in order for that to be able to happen. You then need to essentially continue with an integration practice that allows you to notice when those patterns start to come up Mm -hmm. so that you can stop them from playing out. So something like a really good um, thing that you can do for integration is meditation Um, because meditation allows you to maintain that space between your thoughts and your actions. So the more space you have in your mind between the thought that you have and the way that you act on it, the more you just have choice and you live consciously rather than living on autopilot. And that's really what we're looking for with psychedelics is what we're looking for with yoga, with meditation, with the majority of practices. We're just trying to live consciously so that we're not kind of ruled by our habits and impulses that are not helpful to us. And so if we can eradicate those impulses that sabotage our goals, then we get to a point where we make things happen, but it feels effortless Mm. so you know like if you know that you want to train for Everest and you've got rid of that negative pattern of whatever it was maybe it's that and this I I don't know about you so it's like I'm literally just presuming something but like say like you get to a point where you start training and then like you just fall off the wagon because you're like do you know what I I just can't do this (laughs) (laughs) so imagine that you're then falling off the wagon with your training Um, If you had enough time between your thought and your impulse where you'd go, oh, actually, I won't do it today, you'd go, well, actually, I will do it today because I have this end goal. And it allows you to just zoom out and think big picture rather than uh, instant. And so as humans, one of the funniest, weirdest things about us is that we have an ability to long term plan, but we always prioritize how we're gonna feel in the short term versus how we're gonna feel in the long term. So Mm, our future of how we feel in the next 10 minutes is a hundred million times more important to us than how we're gonna feel in 10 years time. So if I say I could punch you in the face now or I could punch you in the face in 10 years, pretty much everyone would say 10 years (laughs) of course (laughs) i'd have a better one in 10 years but you don't know that (laughs) give me time to move back (laughs) and so we never want the thing that is going to be harder in the short term if it means the long-term goal unless we've really really worked on that muscle of essentially self-discipline or or dedication you would love that peaceful warrior film yeah and wayne dies the shift uh, I have, I'll I, send you the link. Yeah, to please do. But they're massively powerful. So this is the, the quote that I wanted to say is by Charles Du Bois, which says, the important thing is this, to be able at any moment to sacrifice what we are for what we could become. It's powerful. And it's just that idea that like, if you are prepared to let go of all that you know, all that you think you are, all that you are living right now in order to become what it is that you truly desire and you focus on that, then you'll live out your human potential. And that's what I find so exciting about both coaching, psychedelics and business is that they're all methods for us raising consciousness and living out human potential. Just last before we we touch on it, just say that quote once again, just so the listeners can hear it because that's massively powerful. It's huge, isn't it? 
So the important thing is this, to be able at any moment to sacrifice what we are for what we could become. That's powerful, definitely. And how can the guys get in touch with you if they wanna speak to you more about like business or psychedelics or whatever it is that they may have resonated with you on the podcast? Absolutely, I would love to catch up with you guys. So um, you can follow me on Instagram at I am Rosie Peacock or you can come and find me over on my website at www.rosiepeacock.com. I'm Rosie with an I-E at the end, not with a Y. Um, and I also have a group on Facebook called the Soulful Success Society. So if you are a business owner who likes to run your business in a way that has integrity, ethics and soul at the center of what you do, then definitely come and join us over in there as well. Cool. Well, thank you for joining us on the podcast today. Thank you for having me. It's been Pleasure. fun.